Okay. There we go. Okay, good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the commission's weekly online event. Um, yes, you can call us a webinar. We won't be offended. Um, <laughs> where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians. Um, we do these shows every Wednesday morning live at 10 a.m. Central Time, but they are all recorded, so if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can always go to our website and see the recordings of all of our sessions, going back to our very first one, which was January 2009, so we're on our fifth year. Woohoo! This is Sixth like year, yeah. a 216th episode mm -hmm. or something like oh, that? Oh, I haven't yes. counted, but yeah. Well, okay. I've been working on those files. <laughs> um, we do all sorts of things here, presentations, interviews, um, little mini training sessions, book reviews. Basically, if it's related to libraries, we'll put it on the show. We're not picky. Um, we do have commission staff, Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations, and we bring in um, guest speakers, too, um, which we have a mixture of today. Uh, once a month, generally the last Friday of last Wednesday, Wednesday of the month, <laughs> last week of the month, um, we do a more techie-based one, Tech Talk with Michael Sowers. Michael Sowers, next to me, is our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And he comes on once a month to do um, update us on the tech news of the month um, and sometimes have um, guest speakers on, interviews, whatnot. Um, and so that's what we're doing this morning. So I will hand over to you, Michael, and you can take it away and do your thing. All right. And Thanks, Krista. <laughs> um, so this month's Tech Talk, um, I, I do have some news that I'll, I'll share at the end. But what I have uh, done this month is uh, brought in Richard Byrne, who is the uh, blogger at Free Technology for Teachers, which currently has over 45,000 subscribers. And um, I'm one of them. And I know we have some people who have, uh, uh, are attending today in the audience who are regular readers there. Uh, so I'm trying to turn on Richard's microphone. So Richard, oh. you've muted yourself. You need to unmute yourself on your side. Oh, there, there we go. go. Can you hear us? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. All right, there we go. Uh, the, the, the joy of having people uh, in uh, remote. So what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to give uh, Richard presentation control, and he's got kind of a, a short presentation for us. Uh, we've talked to him ahead of time, and... He is more than happy to take questions as he's going through his presentation. So if you've got a question as uh, he's talking, feel free to just go ahead and type that in or raise your hand and, and we'll turn on your microphone for you. So uh, Richard, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, and um, share what you have for us. All right. So uh, thanks for having me, first of all. Let's, uh, well, a little bit about me. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen what I do, uh, from the shameless commerce division of my life. Uh, I primarily run the blog freetechforteachers.com, uh, which is actually decided to load slowly right now. Uh, <laughs> there it is. Uh, and I started this blog about five and a half years ago as part of a project to fulfill a grant requirement my school received. Uh, and one thing led to another, and here I am talking to you. Uh, my, my background in education, I taught high school social studies for eight and a half years. Uh, prior to that, I taught, uh, taught an English language arts class for a year, a job I was woefully underqualified for, but I was willing to try. Uh, and before that, I was uh, a trainer at FedEx Ground, formerly known as RPS. Uh, so that's my, my background in education, and today, for the last uh, 12 about 15 months now, actually. Uh, my full-time job has been running freetechforteachers.com, iPadAppsForSchool.com, Practical Ed Tech, uh, and doing a lot of professional development uh, workshops with schools around the world. Uh, just came back from, uh, from a short trip to Costa Rica where I uh, got to observe a really neat program from the Ecology Project International that's working to get uh, local kids involved in conservation. Uh, so a really interesting project that I'll probably probably be blogging about sometime in the next week. So there's that's my background, uh, and today I'm going to kind of share some of the resources that that I've really promoted over the last year or so. Uh, some of you may have seen me talk about these before, or or uh, write about these tools before, but most of them have 
have gone through some updates in the last six months, and I would like to kind of highlight some of those. Uh, and just one last little piece about me. Uh, if you subscribe to teacher li to the uh, school library school library journal, uh, I do have a monthly article that comes out uh, about technology that you can find there as well. So, uh, rather than using slides today, I'm going to share uh, my live desktop. I, don't, I always prefer to do this over sharing slides because sharing slides just gives you a static shot of uh, of the tool. Uh, this gives you a much more uh, realistic look at the tools that I'm talking about. Uh, and I've kind of organized these things into three general categories of discovering information, uh, discussing information, and demonstrating uh, what, what we've learned, or having students demonstrate what they've learned. Uh, so I'm going to start here with this, a neat discovery tool that, again, uh, has been out for about a year and a half now. It's called Guru. You can find it at gurulearning.com, or .org, I apologize, gurulearning.org. And they actually have an iPad app that goes along with the, the website, so you can use it either way. But it's, it's really a, a neat tool for finding curated collections of resources uh, around math, science, social studies, ELA. Uh, the collections include video clips. They include uh, text-based articles. And it, it's a nice tool for students when they're starting to research a, a topic and they're starting to look into a topic uh, because it kind of gives them all the, the basics in, in one nice package. I mean, we can just take a look right now at their one of the featured collections that's going by. Uh, so here's our Memorial Day collection. Uh, we can jump into that collection if my computer will. There we go. I just click on the study button here, and we can see, you know, in this case, we've got a little little picture about Memorial Day, and we'll go on to our next portion here as they framed up some resources from History.com, and then they framed up a video that we could watch about Memorial Day as well. Uh, so it's a nice tool for students, and you can create your own collections if you log in. I think that's a really neat tool if you want to uh, design your own little collection of materials specific to something that, that you're teaching or your students are learning about. So moving on from, from Guru, I want to share my favorite video site for students and educators. And it's called Next Vista for Learning. Next Vista for Learning was started by a teacher, his name is Rustin Hurley, uh, one of the most entertaining speakers I've ever seen in my life as well. Uh, but Next Vista for Learning was started with the purpose of having students create videos that teach a lesson and having teachers share videos that teach a lesson. All the videos are reviewed by a real person before they go live. Uh, they have to meet the criteria of teaching a short lesson in order to be featured on the site. You can download all the videos that you find. So if your school doesn't have a great uh, wireless network, doesn't have a great internet uh, bandwidth, you can download them ahead of time and play, and play them directly from your computer. And they also, on NextVista for Learning, will run contests throughout the year. And the contests are great because they give you little prompts about uh, a video project. A lot of times we're thinking, well, I want to do a video project, but I'm not sure which direction to go in. Or it's kind of like uh, a creative writing prompt, only in this case it's for, for videos. Let's just take a look at some of the videos that we can find right now. And you can see we're we're divided into three categories. The light bulbs are kind of are the lessons. The global views are uh, so light bulbs are more of a the how-to thing. Global view is more of a conceptual idea. And then seeing service is to highlight projects that people have done in their communities to help others. Let's just take a look at one of the light bulbs. So here's a a new math video. I have not watched this math video yet, but 
it'll give us an idea of what this site is like. So we click through and we pull up solid figures and here we go. Richard, just a, a quick question uh, because it's it's just the way Go to Webinar works. Can I can I assume that there's some audio going along with this video? It's just we're we're not hearing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is uh, the, the audio didn't get broadcasted there. Uh, yeah, that, sorry about that. Yeah, no, that's fine. We just wanted to let people know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, so the the audio didn't didn't get broadcasted there, unfortunately. Uh, but what I want to highlight before we move on from Nick's Vista is you'll see that this was created as part of one of the recent contests. And you can jump through and see all the all the finalists here, and all the finalists and all the contest winners are chosen by teachers uh, who attend workshops or attend conferences uh, where Next Vista for Learning is is giving uh, presentations. And so it, it's really you know it, it's not just some arbitrary panel. It's actually real educators that end up voting on these and, and, and promoting these videos to the, to the top of the list. And again, if you wanted to download them. Uh, we can we can download this video as well. Now, of course, we've got YouTube, and you know, YouTube, love it or hate it, uh, you know, it does have some really great material that our students can can use to review a topic. Uh, I will put my bias out there and say that I'm I'm not a, a huge proponent of of the flipped classroom model, uh, just because. It, in, in my in my area where, where I live and where I work, uh, we have some major obstacles to overcome to, to make the flipped classroom work, one of them being internet access period. Uh, a lot of our students don't have internet access at home. Uh, but so moving on from my bias about the flipped classroom, uh, I will say that if your students do want to find some good review materials, there's often a lot to be found on YouTube. And if you want to organize materials for your students from YouTube. Guru that I mentioned earlier is a great tool to do that with because we can pull in materials that are from YouTube but also pull them in from other resources as well. One of my favorite YouTube channels right now is Crash Course uh, by John, John and Hank Green. Uh, they've written, written books along, this, along these topics as well uh, but we can find See these great series of videos on history, science, and now they've expanded into literature as well. And if you do want to have students or yourself make some make some uh, video lessons, one of the apps that I really like for the iPad is called Nomia. Uh, Nomia Teach, and Nomia Teach people that started the flipped classroom or the, the flipped camera many years ago but it eventually got bought out by Cisco uh, they took some of the money that they made and st started this site called Nomia the Nomia site itself is kind of like Guru where you can go and find it find collections of instructional videos uh, but the Nomia teach app which is a free iPad app can be used by yourself or by your students to create demonstration videos, instructional videos. And the nice thing about it is, uh, unlike some other apps where you can't include your face, uh, in the Nomia Teach app, you can actually include uh, yourself. You can use video of yourself for your iPad uh, as opposed to just being a whiteboard publication. I do like making videos. I, I think it's a, a great medium uh, for students to really engage them and and, and a process that they enjoy. Uh, one of the great things about a video project is at the end of a video project, you can get your students together and you can sit down and you can watch the videos together and spend half an hour 
watching the videos or however long it, long it takes. Uh, and for the most part, kids really enjoy that review process of showing off their work and looking at uh, their other, other students' work in a way that they couldn't do with uh, a written project, uh, a report. You know, the, the end of a two-week project in which students write a report, you're not going to sit down and have every student read every report the other one that the other students wrote, uh, in part because you just don't have time for that, but also because it's not terribly exciting. Uh, but a video project can get everyone involved. And the, the other nice thing about a video project that I like is that it's so accessible to everyone uh, besides your students. If you want to have the, the principal come in and stop by for five or ten minutes and see what your students have done, uh, I think that's a fantastic thing that you can do as opposed to going to the principal's office and saying, hey, look at the 25 awesome essays that my students wrote. You know, your principal probably doesn't have time for that, but they do have the five or ten minutes to stop into your classroom and look at a video. Uh, so one of the tools that, I, that I'm really excited about that, that launched this year for making videos is called Video. Uh, you can find it at video.co. And it's a tool for making animated videos by dragging and dropping artwork into place and then you can add, a add your narration to it or add a soundtrack in the background. Uh, I'll just show you 30, less than 30 seconds here of a demonstration of it. Again, we're not going to hear the sound, but you'll be able to see how it works. And as you can see, all they've done here, to these are pieces of artwork that were in the catalog. And so what we've seen there, all the all the elements of that twenty second clip were created just by dragging and dropping artwork that's in the video uh, tool. So fantastic tool. It works online so it, you don't have to download any software to your computer. And if your students have a, a Mac at school and a PC at home, they can keep working on their projects wherever they are. And of course you can go and look at what other people have done. Now Thing Link's a tool that I've written about a number of times and they just launched a new iPhone and iPad app uh, just launched it yesterday actually. Uh, so now all the things that you used to be able to do with it online you can do on your iPad or your uh, iPhone. And let's take a look at what ThingLink does. ThingLink allows you to create interactive images. And you can upload any picture that you have as a PNG or, or JPEG file uh, and you can add these little interactive pin marks to it. Let's just take a look at one that's here in the gallery. Uh, so this is a public gallery and we'll just take a look at this picture here. And in this particular picture we'll see, all right, check out some of our favorite video projects and these pin marks include the option to play a video. And so these this person just came along and they added these little pin marks. Right, we've got some related pictures. I'm going to go ahead and log into my account and I'll show you how you can make your own picture interactive. So here in my account, let's say I want to take a picture that I have and I'm just going to upload a picture that I have on my desktop. So I've got this picture of Kilimanjaro that I might want to work with, or this picture of people diving underwater. Let's drag that over. And so that picture's uploaded. Now, now that it's uploaded, I can just click on it and add this little pin mark. And I might say this was 
a picture taken in the Pacific Ocean. I say diving in the Pacific. And I could put a link into any set that I wanted to. I'll just say Pacific.com. I don't know if that's a real website or not, but I'll just put that in for now. One of the ways I've seen this used by teachers and, and students is to upload a picture like this one and have students identify, okay, what kind of plant is this? And when they add their description, they'll write about the type of plant that that is, and they might put in a link to the source of the information they're using. They put in a link to a video clip about that particular plant. Uh, they could also put in a link to another picture or put in a link to an audio recording about that particular plan. I'm going to save this picture and allow anyone to edit the picture. And so as the teacher, I may start the project by uploading this picture and then share it out and tell my students they need to go ahead and now they need to add their own pin marks to this project. Hey, Richard, I got a question for you. Now, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, on uh, back on that service you were just showing us, um, you you kind of partially yeah. answered my question in in the you can you can share the image. Can you share the image and and whatever you've done to it outside of Thing Link, like embedded in a blog post or something, or is it pretty much locked into this service here? No, well, you can you can embed this picture into a blog post or into a into a wiki page, and it will work in that web page or that, that blog post just like it does here on the site as well. Oh, great. Uh, so let's, let's just go ahead and I'll show you quickly if I can share it. Uh, you can see I can grab this embed code for it. I can copy and paste that and wherever I put it, the, the image still works. And back in my settings here, uh, when I was using the edit button, if I had, if I say allow anyone to edit, they can even edit the picture while they're on the blog post as opposed to having to come over here to ThingLink. Uh, they will have to have a ThingLink account in order to do that, uh, but once they have their account, anytime they see that picture, they can go ahead and, uh, and start to add their own pin marks. In fact, that's a great question because I uh, recently saw the Bleacher Report, which is a sports blog, uh, has started doing this and started to include, include images and, and asking people to, to tag the pictures as well. It's been a, a great conversation starter on some of their blog posts. Great, thanks. You're welcome. So, great question. Uh, so, it's a rewrite thing. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I taught language arts for a year. <laughs> and rewrite think is a, is a tool that I think anyone who teaches language arts or anything remotely close to teaching language arts should really have, really have bookmarked. Uh, Read Write Think provides lots of great lesson plans, but they also provide a lot of uh, neat interactive tools, uh, including uh, a poetry app for the iPad that I, that I think is great. Uh, and they also have a, an app for creating uh, fictional trading cards uh, about historical people, about historical events, uh, characters from books. If you want your students to develop a, you know, develop a fictional trading card about characters from The Great Gatsby. Uh, that's, a, I think, a really interesting way to get kids involved in, in analyzing the things that they're reading. Now, as a teacher, or as a, anyone, really, uh, who's using the web, we all have our, our favorite services for bookmarking things. Uh, if you are still bookmarking things to your computer, by the way, please stop doing that. Uh, so, so that if your computer crashes or, or you, uh, something, you get a virus or something to that effect, you don't lose all your bookmarks. At the end of every school year, I, I, I still get lots of people asking me, how do I get all my bookmarks because the IT department is taking my computer for the summer and I'm not going to be able to get to them. Uh, so please find a, an online service that you like for uh, bookmarking. The, a new service that I really like, and in the interest of full disclosure, I uh, have kind of advised this company a little bit. Uh, it's called EduClipper, uh, EduClipper.net. 
if you're looking at it right now, it looks a bit like Pinterest. Uh, and I've actually described it as kind of being like what teachers would want Pinterest to be if they could design it from the ground up. Uh, so Edu Clipper, as you can see, I can I can bookmark sites. I'm currently looking at the community page where anyone who has used the service can share their bookmarks or share their links. The difference between using Edu Clipper and using a service that's designed for general consumers, general web users, uh, is that Edu Clipper was designed for teachers. Uh, in addition to bookmarking links, I can also upload PDFs. I can upload documents that I have stored on my computer. I can make those documents or these or my uh, public or private. I can create a group just for my classroom. So if I want to have all of my students, even my students who don't have email addresses, uh, at contributing to a group page of bookmarks or a group page of resources, I can do that and I can keep it private. Uh, or I can go ahead and I can make my bookmarks public. Let's take a look. I mean, right now we've got, uh, you can see that Adam, who's actually the founder of EduClipper, has just pinned this in the last 22 hours. And if I want to go ahead and take a look at it, right, here's a blog post that he liked. I can go ahead and I can reclip it. And so now it becomes part of my own clipboard. And I'll just put it on that clipboard. And so now it's become a part of my own clipboard that I can share publicly as I've done here, or I can put it onto a private clipboard. So a couple of the neat aspects that are available in EduClipper right now, I think uh, teachers are really going to enjoy moving forward. And speaking of keeping up with uh, what What's new in our field? I was a I was a long time user of Google Reader. Uh, I think many of you probably use Google Reader as well. Google Reader is shutting down in July, July first. So you have uh, about 32 days to find a replacement for a Google Reader. The tool that I'm using primarily to replace Google Reader is called Feedly. You can find it Feedly.com. And I like Feedly because it works on the web. As you can see right now, I'm using it at Feedly.com, and I'm logged into my account. It also works on iOS, and it works for Android. I like the magazine aspect of it, the mini magazine aspect of it. I can quickly scroll through, just like I could do in Google Reader. But I can share all of my favorite things from here directly out to any number of services, including Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, Google+, uh, Evernote, where I bookmark all my resources, or I can mark them save for later here and come back and read my read my favorite articles later. Uh, if there's a long article that I don't have time to really read, but I want to make sure I do read it, I'll just put it in my save for later column, and I can again share out to all my favorite services as I like. You'll notice I have created a, a number of groups over here on my left-hand side. Uh, so I've got a, a tech news, tech business, my ed tech leaders group. Uh, and these were all imported directly from my Google Reader account. So if you're still using Google Reader uh, and you want to import directly into Feedly, you can do so. Richard? Yes? We do have a question from the audience about the um, sure. Feedly there. Um, are you able to give someone a link to your bookmark so they could use it as a sort of subject guide? So like if I want to, let's say I'm in my, uh, my EdTech Leaders column here, could I share this whole group? Is that the question? Right. No, I can't share this whole group out. Uh, I'd have to send out the individual articles. Mm -hmm. But that makes a great segue mm -hmm. into... The next service I was going to mention, uh, which does have that capability, uh, it's ah. called Flipboard. Uh, Flipboard, uh, yep, you're welcome. Flipboard.com uh, is an app for the iPad and for Android. Doesn't have a, a great web interface the way that 
the way that Feedly does, uh, which is the reason why I don't use it as often. But if you're an, if you're addicted to your iPad or your Android tablet, this is a fantastic tool for you because you can create your own digital magazines. Uh, you can create a digital magazine, and that magazine is formulated by all the things that you subscribe to or bookmark as you read through Feedly. I'm uh, sorry, as you read through Flipboard. Uh, so if I want to share that magazine out, and I, I've made magazines uh, that I've shared out with other people, they subscribe to my magazine and they'll see everything that I think is important. So if I wanted to make a subject guide, uh, you know, on my favorite educational technology blogs, I can make a magazine and say, these are the best educational technology blogs. Please subscribe to my magazine. And anytime I bookmark or anytime I share something in that magazine, everyone else who subscribes to my magazine uh, sees those updates as well. So we can take a you know, if you want to take a quick look at it uh, and kind of browse through and you see make your own flipboard magazine. Like I said, it doesn't have a doesn't have a web interface that's as good as Feedly, uh, but you can bookmark from the web from your web browser to Feedly. So if I'm using my web browser, I can say I want to send this to my Flipboard magazine, and I just turned on my screen capture tool. There we go. There we go. Now my computer's uh, now my computer's kind of bogging down. But here we go. So just a switch, kind of a, a switch from looking at information and finding information into uh, planning or working with the information. Uh, text to mind map is. I'm a big fan of mind mapping because I I think it's a great interface for kids to really see the connections between topics. Uh, and text to mind map. I, I like and I've used with my own students in the past because it, it does a really neat thing for me. So you see on the left hand side of the screen I have an outline. I can just type an outline and on the right hand side of the screen the outline becomes a mind map for me. So for my student who prefers the outline format over the web format, we have that. And my student who prefers the web format over the outline format, they have that as well. We can download our finished product when we like, and it's super easy to use because you don't have to create an account in order to use it. So let's just create a new outline, and we'll call it New England Weather, and we'll just say Spring, and we just say Cold and Muddy. And we'll say summer is also cold and buggy. And I might want to change it up and say Midwest weather. And now I'll start a new subtopic. Now let's hit draw a mind map. And you see everything that I've connected here. It, so all my things that showed up under New England weather show up here in the mind map. Nice little tool for planning a project or outlining any kind of topic. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a, I love having students make videos. I also like the idea of having students make quick podcasts that they can use to kind of document what they've learned or document their thoughts, record their thoughts, and share their thoughts. And you don't have to use any fancy tools really to make a podcast today. Uh, if you just want to do a simple recording, SoundCloud, you can find it at soundcloud.com. It can be used on the web, can be used on Android or iOS. Uh, to simply create a short recording, you could be recording your voice, you could be recording some music that you're playing. Uh, you can share the work to the whole world or you can keep your work private if you want to use your sound your recording in another project. For example, if I wanted to make a recording in SoundCloud and then use it over here in my video project, I could do that because I can download my, my recording. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to log into my account here. 
and will put me on the spot to make sure I remember all my accounts. And let's just double check. But what SoundCloud also offers, I think, is really neat, is the option to comment on your recording directly at the spot that you're prompted by a prompted with a thought. So, for example, here's one of my recordings. As I play it, and I, granted, you're not going, going to be able to hear it. So I can pause it right there at two seconds in and write a comment and say, please consider da 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 da. So anywhere in my recording, I can insert these comments. One of the neat thing, neat ways I've seen this used is by foreign language teachers or world language teachers to correct students on their verb conjugation or the or their pronunciation of a particular word. The students record in SoundCloud using one of the apps or using the web, and teachers can reply exactly where the student needs to hear it. So there at six seconds in, we could add another comment. Uh, I decide I want to share this out. Again, there's a link. We could embed it. Uh, we can embed this recording into our thing link, for example. Back, back here, if I wanted to allow my, oops, allow my students to add some recordings, they could add a recording right here with their SoundCloud. So if I wanted to grab that SoundCloud link, I could add it to my ThingLink project. And again, if I wanted to use this in my multimedia project, my video project, I could go ahead and I could download that recording. Now, another tool for uh, helping students kind of make presentations or uh, work with media is Pixlr. Uh, Pixlr is a free video, uh, sorry, not video, image editing suite. Uh, you can use the Pixlr tools online. You can also use the, the Pixlr tools on your mobile device. Uh, it could be your, your Android or your iOS device. Uh, and they have some, some very basic and quick apps for cropping pictures. You just need to resize the picture to some much more advanced uh, tools that you can use for uh, editing the layers in a SVG file, for example. So it's kind of up to you how, how much uh, editing power you need, but all the tools are free, and you can start with one of the simple tools and move into some of the more advanced tools. And if your students need a good place to find pictures that they can legally reuse in their presentations, in their blog posts, or in their, in their video projects. Pixabay.com is my favorite place to find public domain images. Uh, I like Pixabay because all the images are available as high resolution images. Uh, as I mentioned, they're all public domain. You can create a Pixabay account if you like, and you can download pictures to your heart's content. You can also download pictures uh, without creating an account. However, if you try to download pictures without creating an account, uh, you're limited to the resolution. Uh, the resolution is not available as a high resolution unless you create an account. Accounts are free. Great place to, to find pictures. I absolutely, absolutely love it. Uh, your students, I just want to get them out of the habit of going to Google Images. Uh, Google Images is not a great place to find public domain pictures. Uh, Pixabay is absolutely fantastic place to, to find public domain images. And let's just do a, a quick search here. I want to search for a picture of a, I don't know, a boat. I need a picture of a boat for my presentation. Here's a picture. And I want to download it. There we go. I can choose from the resolutions that I need. Let's go ahead and download the 640 megapixel picture. And now it's downloaded to my computer. Uh, 
one thing to keep in mind is that Pixabay is supported by advertising, so you do see advertisements for images from uh, image resellers like Shutterstock or sometimes big stock images show up. These images over here are not available for free. Uh, just to point that out to, to you, and it's important to point that out to students or anyone else you're going to show this, this site to is that these tools over here, these images here on the right under Shutterstock are not available for free, but everything that you see here is available for free. Let's go back to my search results. All of these pictures, again, available for free for me to download. You can see some of it is clip art and some of it is uh, just great high resolution artwork. Now, speaking of presentations, I'm making a presentation. A haiku deck is my absolute favorite iPad app right now uh, for making a presentation. One of the things I love about Haiku Deck is as I'm creating my presentation, if there is a word that I really want to emphasize, uh, I can type that word into my slide and Haiku Deck will search for Creative Commons licensed pictures that are uh, available that match that image or match that word. All the images are high resolution. They fill the entire screen. That's a really important thing to teach students about presentation design uh, is to use high resolution pictures whenever possible so you don't get uh, pixelated looking pictures. Uh, the other nice thing about Haiku Deck is that it kind of intentionally limits how much text a student can put on a slide. And it shows students very quickly that the more they type, the smaller their font gets. One of the rules that I always had for my students is that your font size could be no smaller than twice my age. Uh, so every year, obviously, the font was getting bigger. Uh, but what that meant for my students is they always had to have font that was at least 48, size 48, uh, which does two things. It limits how much text the student can put on a slide, and it really forces students to think about the visuals as opposed to the text so that they're not uh, relying on, on bullet points and talking off of bullet points by the present. So Haiku Deck, free application. Uh, a few weeks ago, they announced that they got $3 million in venture capital funding to use it to move this technology into a web application as well. So I'm looking forward to that coming along very soon. And two quick tools here for uh, getting feedback from students. Uh, Socrative is a tool that I've, I've used for the last two years. Uh, I think it's a, a great tool for polling your audience, asking, asking students uh, some informal questions, get informal feedback. But you can also use it as a quiz tool if you want to ask students to jump into a quiz uh, and you can get the get the feedback from them in a quiz format where their name is attached to their work, at, or you can use it in a, as an anonymous feedback tool. Right, I'll give you a, a quick little look at how it functions as a teacher. So I'm going to log into my account, which is this lecture panel. So if I go ahead and I log in. Let me put in my name. And I'm going to set up a room very quickly for you to participate in one of my informal quizzes. So here's my teacher panel that has just popped up on the screen. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give you my room number, which is 52234. And so if you want to participate here, I'm going to put this in the chat box. If you want to participate, what you need to do is go to the following link, which is m.socrative.com. Oh, and I just sent that to the send that to everybody. And my, uh, if one of the chat organizers can push that out to the whole audience, that would be great. But what this allows me to do is if you go to m.socrative.com and you enter my room number, which is 52234, 
you can participate in one of my quizzes. It looks like I'm not allowed to send out a, a message to everyone. Uh, I'm only allowed to send it to chat organizers. Uh, so I apologize for that. Uh, but what this allows me to do is, let's say I want to make a short answer quiz. I can make my quiz anonymous. So if I'm asking students a question that's uh, maybe a little bit sensitive in, in its nature, uh, for example, if I wanted to ask my students, how long did it take you to read last night's assignment? And if I'm working with students who are struggling readers, they may not be so willing to raise their hand and say, well, it took me an hour to read the, the two pages. Uh, but if I ask this in an anonymous format where I don't know which student said what, I can get a much more honest uh, survey of my, of my class that way. Or I can use an activity. Oh, it looks like we have some people join the room, so awesome. Or I can use a quiz-based activity in which I have pre-made quizzes on any number of topics, and I have a, I have a bunch of them here in my account. I have a it's my mountain quiz. And I can do this as a teacher-paced or student-paced assignment. So if I want to say that you, say to each student, you only have 30 seconds to answer a question, I can advance them through each screen. So, so Crowder recently added the option to include pictures in my questions. So if I wanted to, for example, upload a screenshot of a math problem, I can do that and ask students to answer questions based on that. But since I have a couple of people in the room here, I've got five people in the room, and I can tell because uh, as a teacher here, it tells me who's in the room. I can do a quick short answer question, and I can simply say, uh, here's the question, complete the sentence, complete the phrase, keeping up with the blank, and I'll make it anonymous, and we'll start the activity. And if you're participating remotely right now, uh, you'll be able, your screen will change, and you'll be able to answer the question. And you can put in anything you want, keeping keeping up with the Kardashians, the Joneses, there we go, that's a common one, uh, the big pile of laundry that you have right now, whatever it is. Uh, we've got three Joneses. The thing I love about the Joneses response is that we always get different spellings of it. And when we're done, I can say, end of the activity, and I can grab a report of the responses. If I had asked you to put in your name, the report would include your name and your response. The nice thing about this is even if I ask you for your name, when I'm showing this screen, your name doesn't show up. So I can still show this in front of the class and say, okay, we're going to vote on the best response. We don't see that, uh, that Billy wrote librarians and that Susie wrote Joneses, we just see the responses. So it's a, a nice tool. If we still want to show all the responses to students, we can do that. That's a Socrative tool. And a new tool that came out last fall that uses a, a very similar concept to Socrative, uh, the idea of having this room where my students can respond to me using their, their web browser or their iPad or their, their Android device. Uh, it's infused learning. Uh, infused learning, again, does the same thing as Socratic with two differences that are worth noting. Number one, infused learning allows students to draw responses freehand. So I can ask you a question and ask you to uh, perhaps solve a math question. And for a lot of us, solving a math question is easier to do if we can write out the answer as opposed to trying to type out the answer or if we want to ask someone to diagram, you know, here's the question, please diagram your response. We can have students diagram the response. The other nice piece about infused learning is that you can have questions dictated to students. So if you want to include an audio recording, 
you can do that through infused learning. Uh, but otherwise, the, the same concept applies. Another tool that, that's been around for a while, but has recently gotten a bunch of updates, it's called Padlet. It used to be called Wallwisher. Uh, Padlet's a great tool for, again, gathering that kind of informal feedback from students. Uh, we can write on a giant sticky note wall. Uh, Padlet works in your web browser. It will, it's a great tool on an interactive whiteboard because students can come up and drag and drop and rearrange notes. Also works on your Android or iPad device. Let's go ahead and let's just build a wall here quickly. And it just takes a second. One of the things I can do now is I can just go ahead and start typing notes. So here's my name. And you say this is a note. You can write up to 160 characters. You can include a link. If I want to include the, a link to a picture or a link direct to a website, I can do that. You can also upload a file. So let's say I have something saved on my desktop, like this Call Me Maybe video. I can drag and drop it in so that people can go ahead and they can grab that attachment. Or I can take a picture with my webcam. Now, I used Wallwisher or Padlet, as it's now called, with a number of my classes to quickly share notes while we were reading an assignment. All right. We're gonna, we're all going to read this section of All Quiet on the Western Front. As you read, put your notes on the wall. Then we'll discuss the notes when we're done reading that day. Now. I can modify this wall to give the title, to include a nice little widget or icon in the upper left. Currently, I'm using the freeform response, so I can write notes anywhere I want. But if I change the layout into a stream format, then all our posts become much more organized in, in a vertical alignment. But I think most important here is the privacy option. If I'm logged into my account, I can make a wall private so that only the people I add by email can see it. But I can also make it password protected so that anyone can see the wall. But if they want to add a note, let's say they can write on the wall, and they have to put in the password. So if I want my students to write on the wall, but I don't want everybody in the world to see to see it, I'll tell my students, here's the link to the wall, and when you get there, you need to put in the password. I'm going to put in the password of Max. Max is the name of one of my dogs. So go to the wall, type in the word Max when you're asked for a password, and now you have access to the wall. So it's a nice tool that you can go quickly from public to private, depending on your needs. Another nice tool for kind of collaborative note taking and sharing of notes is called Video Notes. Uh, video Notes, we can find it at video note dot, or video not dot es, uh, kind of a, a funny URL. Uh, but Video Notes is a tool that allows you to watch a video on the left hand side of your screen and take notes on the right hand side of your screen. And your notes can be shared with anyone you want to share them with. It integrates with Google Drive. So if you're a Google Apps for Education school, uh, this is a tool that your students can use without having to create a new account. Uh, they can simply watch the video and take notes together on a video. It's a nice way to uh, you know, show a video. I mean, as a social studies teacher, I love showing videos because there are all kinds of great little video clips out there. But oftentimes, it was we'd watch the video, then we'd stop and talk about it. Uh, and if you wait until the end of the video, sometimes the, the students' questions have gone by or their comments have gone by. But if they can react in real time, you can have a much deeper conversation, I think. Right, we're going to wrap up with uh, 
four last quick tools here. Uh, class charts, a nice tool that I, that's uh, again a new new tool that, that launched this year. Uh, it's a tool for classroom management. Uh, you can create seating charts. You can and on those seating charts, you can give stu each student feedback on uh, their behavior for the day, their uh, their progress for the day. You, they can earn little badges that you assign to them for completing a certain number of tasks or completing a task. And it's a nice way for students to uh, see how they're doing throughout the course of the day or throughout the course of a week. And you can share this work with parents. The parents can log in and they can see how the students are doing as well. Uh, the other nice thing about it is someone who was a substitute teacher for a while I always appreciated it when I could get a seating chart that showed students' faces so I knew which students were supposed to be where. Uh, class charts allows you to do that if you want to upload pictures of the students into your seating chart. Uh, you can do that and then you can share that seating chart if you have someone uh, who's coming into your class for the day. Uh, Sue Media or Sue Media is uh, Nice tool for, again, mashing together audio, video, uh, picture clips from around the web and putting it into one nice presentation. I'm going to wrap up with this uh, one last tool here. Uh, or two last tools, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, 123D Catch is a nice free application from Autodesk. Autodesk produces a lot of applications for modeling. Uh, 123D Catch allows you to take any physical object and turn it into a virtual manipulative, uh, but just by taking a series of pictures around the around the object. Uh, I took a, for example, I took a picture of my dog, took many pictures of my dogs, and stitched them together and created a 3D object of my dogs that students can manipulate on their iPads or on a web browser. And last but not least is a tool that comes from another teacher. And I love tools that are developed by teachers for teachers. This one comes from classtools.net, which is run by Russell Tarr, who's an educator in the UK. Uh, one of the many tools that, that he's put together is the SMS generator. And it's a tool for creating fake text message exchanges between fictional characters or historical characters. Uh, we can go ahead and we can create just a little note here on, you know, you know, hey, Ben, it's George. How are things going in France? Type a note. So we can type another note about it. Let's just put a little more note here. Here's my reply over on this side. George, I have secured the loan from the French. Help is on its way. So in this case, what would a text message exchange from George Washington and Ben Franklin look like? Uh, again, simple little tool. It doesn't require students to create an account. But I think it, and a, a good way to engage students in, in a short creative writing project. So on that note, uh, I'm hoping there are some questions or maybe there are some questions that have, that have popped up. And I'm happy to uh, happy to answer them. All right, Richard, thank you very much. That was, I, you know, I, Chris and I both sitting here taking notes, going, "We got to play with that. We got to play with that." <laughs> um, just to let everybody know, uh, Krista has been uh, logging all of the URLs of all the sites that Richard showed us, and and will be in the show notes with the recording. So if you missed something, we will we will happily uh, provide you with a list to get everything back to. And if you do have any questions. Uh, feel free to you know type them into the chat or raise your hand. We'll happily turn your microphone on. I've got a couple. 
uh, for Richard while we're, we're going in here. Um, and not necessarily specifically about the tools themselves, but uh, the, the, your, your, the site Free Technology, Teacher, Free Technology for Teachers, um, you post a lot. Um, I guess I was wondering if you just talk for just a, a minute or two about wh what is your process? Do you make sure you sit down once a day? Do you schedule things out? H how is it you actually pull this, this site off? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I'll give you the, the short version of it. Is my goal is to write five blog posts a day, Monday through Friday, uh, and to do that, I read. I have a massive list of RSS subscriptions that I that I go through throughout the day, uh, and I will say that, that yeah, to write five blog posts a day, uh, the the hardest part of it, the, the most time-consuming part of it, is actually trying out the resources so that I can uh, give some perspective on how they work and how they how they might fit in the classroom. Uh, I also get a, a ton of emails from uh, companies that are starting up or, or press press people. Uh, but generally, my, my criteria for picking the resources that go on the blog uh, it has to be something that I that I feel like. A teacher or a teacher librarian or, or a school administrator can feel comfortable using in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, could you spend an hour with the tool and then feel comfortable enough to use it in your classroom? Uh, because uh, you know, most of us are not technology teachers. We're not teaching technology classes. We're, you know, we're teaching something else, right? And the technology is, is supposed to help us with that and support us with that. So that's one part of the criteria. Uh, some of the other the other pieces of it, uh, I try to stay away from tools that have you know really intrusive advertising. Uh, I also try to look more and more for tools that are supported uh, with a somewhat sustainable business model, uh, because I, th I think we've all been burned at some point by a, by a favorite resource shutting down or a favorite resource. Uh, switching business models so that it starts to uh, you know, charge for things that, that it used to offer for free. Uh, so that's kind of my, my process. Uh, and I spend, you know, it's, it's a full-time job for me now. Uh, when I was teaching full-time and writing the blog full-time, it was like working two full-time jobs. Uh, you know, so I probably spend eight hours a day uh, to generate those to generate those blog posts, and, and some of the blog posts are shorter, some of them are longer. The the how-to things. Uh, right now, I'm working on a pretty substantial uh, blog post about how to use the new version of Google Maps. Uh, that will take me a couple of hours, as opposed to uh, you know, a couple of minutes sometimes to write an actual blog post because the yeah, you know, like I said, the the hard part is the the trying out the tools. The writing the blog post itself is generally relatively short. Oh, great, thanks, Richard. Um, we do have a question from someone in the audience. Um, a public librarian, actually, and she says, "I'm a public librarian, and I'm a little surprised, but not critical, that teachers are using online tools that require students to make an account, particularly something like Google Drive, which is tied to Google Gmail." Um, can you comment on this? Uh, in terms of creating accounts, uh, well, I, I'm not a not a school law expert by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, however, but but with things like Google Apps, uh, Google Apps for Education in particular, a school can can be the administrator of the account so that they can see where students are are signing in and. and you can use the Google Apps for Education that way without even having to create a Gmail account. Uh, students can, can use Google Apps for Education without creating Gmail. Uh, the fact of the matter is our students are going to have email accounts, period. Uh, you know, I've, got a, I've got a niece who uh, has, has her own email account at seven years old, right? Uh, it, you know, but it's monitored by her parents, right? Her parents kind of oversee it and, and look at it. Uh, you know, so in terms of, you know, do you have to have an email account to sign up for all these services? No, uh, I try to look for services that, that sometimes don't require uh, email accounts. There are some other workarounds. Uh, there's a, a, a Gmail plus one trick uh, that allows students, allows teachers to create 
emails for students that they can then monitor. Uh, so uh, that's just I think that's kind of the nature of using web tools is that often you do have to have an, a, have an account to create an account. But I, I do look for tools that, that don't require that. And, and I would say too, probably you know you would you would follow your school's rules and regulations and things like that on that. Um, this the, 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 these are not unique issues. I'm sure almost all schools are dealing with this at some level. But it's, yeah, so this is a question from a public librarian who doesn't work in a school. So like I didn't, also same situation. I didn't realize there is the Google app specifically for educators that are built that is built for that purpose. So this isn't just saying to your students go out randomly and make a Gmail account. It's we have a thing created specifically by Google for us as schools to use. Right. Yeah. Cool. And a lot of these accounts, like, uh, for example, the, the EduClipper tool that I mentioned, uh, has built into it the function for the, the teacher to create accounts for students that students don't have to have an email address for. Uh, the on the EduClipper, the teacher can, in fact, reset student passwords if a student forgets a password. I think that's that's a huge tool. As someone who's uh, taken students to a computer lab, uh, you probably at some point run into frustration where students have forgotten their passwords, and it's really helpful as a teacher to be able to, or a teacher librarian, or the or the computer lab supervisor to reset the passwords quickly for students as opposed to making them wait for an email back from the service to reset their password. Now, now forgotten passwords, that's something a public librarian can relate to. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I, I got one more question for you, um, and it's got kind of a little bit of a, a left turn from what you've been talking about. It's something I'm personally interested in. I'm reading your bio. It says you are a Google certified teacher. Yep. What is that, and how do you become one? All right, so the Google, cert Google Certified Teacher status, uh, that you can get that by attending the Google Teacher Academy. Uh, the Google Teacher Academy was started, I think, in 2000, late 2007, early 2008. I went through it in 2009. Uh, you do have to apply for it. They have two or three of them every year, and they accept 50 educators, sometimes teachers, sometimes school administrators, sometimes teacher librarians. Uh, Joyce Wollens, a well-known teacher librarian, uh, she and I were in the same same cohort actually in 2009. Uh, so you, the program is not a, a training program per se. It, it's not uh, a how to use Google Apps. It's more of a what can you do with Google Apps. And it's designed for uh, getting educators together to talk about how you can get students, get your school uh, to move forward in their use of technology uh, using Google applications. But uh, the, Google is very uh, open about saying that sometimes there are other tools that may be better than what Google offers, and we are free to talk about those as well. Uh, so it's a day, it's a day and a half program. Uh, the, the hard part is really getting in. The, the hard part is the getting accepted into the program. Uh, and then from there, it's uh, after the after you've gone through the program, there's a uh, a community uh, that supports each other. It's a it's a closed closed community of Google certified teachers for uh, ongoing discussions throughout uh, the year. They have uh, some. They recently had a a reboot camp. Uh, basically, is what they called it uh, for past Google certified teachers to get together again. Uh, now, there's also the Google certified trainer program which is a little bit different. Google Certified Trainer Program, anyone can sign up for and, and do on their own. It's a self-paced program. Uh, Google provides all the tutorials and all the uh, materials you'll need to pass the exams. You have to pay to, you have to, pay to take the exams. Uh, and there, there's a series of exams to get your Google Certified Trainer status. So there is a there is a difference there between the two. They often they often overlap. Uh, often Google certified teachers are also Google certified trainers, uh, but you can't be a Google certified teacher without going through the Google Teacher Academy. Great. All right. Thank you. I was I was kind. Of, I mean, you know, it's one of those things where I know I could Google it, but you know, why not ask somebody <laughs> who's actually done it? So yeah, thank yeah. You, thank you for that. I, I You're appreciate welcome. it. Um, any other questions coming in from the audience at this point? 
No. No. no? no okay. Just tell me right. to share, share a link that um, you actually did a blog post about the Google Teacher Academy apparently no. l- last year sometime. So we'll have a link to that as well in the, in the delicious links that we put together for the show. All right. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Oh, and I'll, I'll just mention that there is going to be a Google Teacher Academy in Chicago in July. It was just announced. I think it's July 23rd to 25th. Could be wrong in those dates. I'm going from my my memory, but uh, uh, the application for that is is available now. All right, great. Well, Richard, I want to thank you uh, very much. I'm I'm sure everybody who who has been uh, watching and everybody who watched the recording will get pl- plenty of resources to to play with. I, I I'm always uh, I always enjoy, but I'm also dismayed by the end of, of sessions like this because. I have 17 more sites that I need to go play with now and, and, and have to find the, the time to do that. So um, thank you uh, for that. So with that, um, uh, we're going to uh, take back control here. Uh, Richard, just one, one last uh, thanks to you. And um, I've just got two things I want to briefly talk about um, before we wrap things up. And so let me just share my screen here. Okay, um, I usually have just a couple of bookmarks and things to, to uh, talk about, and I've just got two in this case. Um, the uh, Richard made made an offhanded comment during the Q and A there about how um, uh, uh, sites that we've been using for a long time uh, changing their business models a little bit. Well, that has happened with Flickr. If you are not a, a regular person who logs into Flickr, or even if you are, you may or may not have heard about um, Yahoo, uh, who owns Flickr, has done a serious redesign of how Flickr works um, and uh, overall I am liking it um, you don't necessarily have to pay for a pro account anymore a lot of what used to be the pro account features are now available in the free account including a terabyte of storage for your images um, but there have been some other changes uh, to to Flickr um, regarding um, uh, display sizes and the interface and things like that. So um, don't want to take a lot of time to talk about Flickr itself, but if you haven't logged in in a while, definitely something that you want to take a look at. The other thing I want to talk about real briefly here, and I'm going to attempt to run a live demo. Um, Google I.O., which is the developers conference, uh, happened just a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things that they announced, they announced a lot of things, is kind of a how Google Voice Search has changed just a little bit. Now some of you may be aware of, I'm here on the Google homepage, that there's this microphone in the search box. Well, they've changed how that microphone works, and eventually the way it's going to work is you'll actually, if you are using Chrome, you'll be able to say, OK, Google, and Google will wake up and actually do a search about what you're talking about next. That has not happened quite yet. But what I am going to do here is I'm going to just do a couple quick sample searches to show you how this works, cross our fingers that this actually will. And this, like I want to stress, uh, does only work in Chrome at the moment. So I'm going to go ahead and click Search by Voice and say, yes, you can use my microphone. Who is Barack Obama? According to Wikipedia, Barack Hussein Obama, too, is the 44th and current president of the United States, the first African-American to hold the office. So um, I don't know how well you might have heard that, but you can see here that it has done the search. It, it took what I spoke, turned it into a search, and because over here on the right you have this info card from him and it's actually spoken back to me some information. But now what get, where it gets really interesting is it, it is starting to pay attention. So it now knows that I've searched for Barack Obama, so now I'm going to ask my next question. How tall is he? Barack Obama is six feet, one inch tall. So you can see here, it's actually paying attention to context. I didn't say who he was. It just figured out that I must be speaking about him. So I'll just do two more quick ones to show you how this continues to work. Who is he married to? Barack Obama's spouse is Michelle Obama since 1992. And one last one. How tall is she? Michelle Obama is 5 feet 11 inches tall. So you can see they're really starting to contextualize how you're searching. You don't necessarily have to literally type in exactly what you're looking for. Um, some other samples I've seen are like directions where you can say something like, what is the weather in Omaha? It'll give me the weather, and then it will say, how do I get there? And it will give me directions to Omaha. 
So it, it's something you might want to play with. Uh, you know, install Chrome real quick. Try that out. Um, it, it's really going to start changing how people search, I think. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and say that uh, Tech Talk is uh, done. And thank mm -hmm. Richard one more time for that, uh, for his presentation and his resources. And mm -hmm. hand, hand it back over to Krista. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Michael and uh, Richard. Um, yes, that is a uh, wrap-up for today. Um, and so the show has been recorded, so you'll be able to listen to that and watch it later. All of the links were captured into the Commission's Delicious account, including the ones that Michael was just talking about, too. So you have all of that in the, um, when we put the recording up. So I hope you'll join us next week when we are talking about the this year's One Book, One Nebraska for 2013, which is O Pioneers um, by Willa Cather. And I'm just going to open it up here so you can see. Um, Um, where we will have actually Andy Jewell will be with us. She, he is the editor of the Willa Cather Archive, which is a website hosted at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, and the co-editor of the new book, Selected Letters of Willa Cather. And so he's going to be coming on the show next week to talk to us about um, her and her writing, and specifically, of course, O Pioneers, which is the um, one book, one Nebraska book um, for the state um, that we are um, for 2013, for what we're doing currently. So um, please uh, sign up and um, join us for that next week. I believe right now also the three books for the local Lincoln one. The, 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 finals, the, the three finalists for Lincoln have been announced. Yeah. I don't remember what they are off the top of my head. Uh, they're on the website. Okay. Yep. <laughs> All right, so please sign up and join us for that next week. Also, um, Encompass Live is on Facebook. So if you are a Facebook user, you can go ahead and like us there, and you will see um, notices of when we have new shows coming up, when the recordings are available, um, when something is going about to start. I just posted this morning. You can see, just log in right now to see, join us on today's show. So definitely follow us, um, like us. Things that we're doing. Other than that, we are all set for the, today. And thank you very much for attending, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.